Joining me now is Joel Rubin, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State during the Obama administration, somebody who understands the dynamics of public pressure very well. Joel, it's great to see you as always, my friend. Let me start by getting Thanks, your Amy. thoughts on this uh, on this United Nations resolution. Uh, it passed 120 to 14. It is obviously symbolic more than it is um, you know, tactical or actually ending or calling or bringing about a ceasefire, but it is important nonetheless. What kind of power does it carry both in terms, uh, real terms and symbolically? Yeah, uh, Eamon, it's great to be with you always. And to your point, there are two kinds of resolutions. There's the binding one that the Security Council passes. That is not what this is. But those resolutions are very uh, significant in terms of requiring countries to take certain actions. And then there are the non-binding ones, as we just saw and as you're describing. That is a, a, an indicator of global opinion and public support or lack thereof. And, and without a doubt, uh, Israel right now understands that there is significant global pressure against going further uh, in its, in its uh, invasion uh, and in its attacks on Gaza. And uh, these are justified responses. I, I do believe that, that Israel is engaged in defending its territory, but it also has to be incredibly mindful of what it is doing in terms of the humanitarian crisis and how it is observing international law. And those are red lines that even President Biden has put out. And uh, uh, that, in many ways, that's the sort of uh, uh, zeitgeist there for Israel and how far will and will not President Biden let Israel go uh, in terms of, of coming close to international law violations. Yeah, you bring up a really good point about the, trying to thread that needle between what Israel yeah. uh, and America say it can and should do as a result of the terrorist attacks on October 7th and what the international community wants it to do to protect uh, Palestinian uh, lives, innocent lives inside the Gaza Strip. And there is clearly a dissonance when it comes to the situation in Gaza with the United States and its allies. And despite that, uh, Joel, the U.S. government is very clear about its support for Israel and its war efforts. And earlier today, there was this moment in the press conference where Israeli officials were referencing the close relationship to the U.S. and thanks to the U.S. for all of its support, almost as if they were, I would say, trying to say that the U.S. is right in this with them. And so long as the U.S. is in this with them, they're going to keep going ahead. What do you make of this kind of dynamic and, and the isolation that the U.S. and Israel find themselves in? Well, it's no secret that the United States, that we are Israel's strongest ally, closest, uh, closest friend and, and biggest backer in terms of military assistance, but also uh, uh, on a variety of, of, of uh, engagements and a variety of uh, components of our bilateral relations. Look, uh, without the United States backing Israel, there would be practically no ability for Israel to continue to go forward. But that still is not what is the question. The question for uh, Israel is, how does it eradicate Hamas and its terrorist infrastructure dismantled in a manner that protects its civilians? And in that, there's really no daylight between the United States and the Israeli government. Uh, but Israel does, and, and Bibi Netanyahu clearly does, want to ensure that he is hugging the United States and validating his efforts. But he has to be careful, because if he goes too far, uh, he is going to face some, some response back. And I think that President Biden has publicly and privately communicated that there needs to be a component that takes care of the humanitarian needs of the Palestinians right now. Yeah, so to that point, what, where do you think that breaking point is? I mean, obviously, yeah. publicly, um, we're probably not going to see it, right? They're reporting now, and there's a lot of reporting here, at least certainly in the U.S. media, about the administration's private discussions with Israel, trying to help them crystallize um, how this operation plays out. I, I, agree, I agree with you. Nobody disagrees what Israel and America's objectives and intentions are here. Yeah. But where do you think that breaking point comes where there is going to be a public statement of, uh, of graver concern than what we've heard so far? So, I mean, it passed his prologue a couple of years ago when there was a, a major uh, flare-up between Israel and Hamas. It took five or six days for President Biden to weigh in. So uh, my sense is he's going to give Israel time, uh, enough time to uh, demonstrate that it is really making gains. And, you know, this is, is uh, the end of the beginning, but not, not really the beginning of the end, as they say. And, and for Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he's talking about how this could be very long. I don't think he has that much time. I would say it would be in the, the amount of weeks. Uh, and in particular, if the humanitarian crisis is not alleviated, if we begin to see, as we are seeing currently, uh, humanitarian suffering because of lack of medicine, lack of food, lack of water, even if it's Hamas to blame, and I believe it is Hamas to blame uh, for the, those uh, deficits, for their people uh, starving and suffering, that nonetheless will still push a, a lot, put a lot of pressure on President Biden 
to tell uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu that he needs to put in a pause and really delay. And, and we're talking weeks. Uh, it can't be much longer yeah. than that is my assessment. Yeah, I think it highlights just how difficult this operation is, both uh, tactically as well as, uh, as strategically, even if there is a consensus on what has to be done. Joel Rubin, uh, always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Edmund.